On August 31st, 1997, the world was shocked when Princess Diana was killed in a car accident in Paris. Today in conversation with Carolyn Harris. We'll pick up our conversation from there, Carolyn. Uh, that was a moment in time that everyone who was alive will remember what they were doing when they heard the news of Princess Diana's death. And I remember a, a headline, I think it was in, in one of the British tabloids, that said, sort of said essentially, speak to us, ma'am, mm -hmm. and referring to the Queen, mm -hmm. and that she had remained silent for a few days after that passing. How much did Diana's death rock the monarchy? Well, it's interesting that the queen throughout her reign had always placed duty first. She'd gone on these long Commonwealth tours uh, with her children uh, remaining in the United Kingdom for extended periods of time. But once the news arrived that Diana, the Princess of Wales, had died in this tragic car accident in Paris, the queen decided it would be best for William and Harry to be out of the public eye, to be at Balmoral Castle in Scotland, surrounded by their extended family, where they could spend time outdoors, grieve privately without being in the public eye. So initially the royal family remained at Balmoral and to the public, this seemed unfeeling. They wanted to see the royal family, how they were responding to this. And so ultimately what happens is the royal family uh, returns to London. There had been talk of a quiet um, Spencer family funeral, but it became clear that there was public interest in this being a big public occasion. So the royal family returns to London. The queen made a speech that was televised about her feelings as a grandmother and that Diana had been a special person who'd made a great impact on many people's lives. And William and Harry walked in the funeral procession with their grandfather, uh, Prince Philip, who passed away recently, their father, Prince Charles, and their uncle, Earl Spencer. And that was a very difficult moment for them. And certainly Prince Harry has spoken extensively about how at the age of 12, that grieving in front of all of these crowds, how difficult that was for him, that it, that it was a very difficult moment. And it's interesting to see that when Prince Philip passed away, um, his youngest grandson was uh, James the Viscount Severn uh, was present at the funeral but wasn't walking in the procession so now there may well be a little more sensitivity for how difficult it is for a child um, to uh, grieve in the public eye. So we see these instances of the, the royal family really responding to the public mood and wanting the the, the, the queen and her family to be there grieving with them, even though their relationship with Diana had been quite a complicated one. Charles and Diana's marriage had quite publicly broken down. And both Prince Charles and Princess Diana had spoken to the press about their difficulties uh, within the marriage, um, Diane had famously stated there was three of us in this marriage, and so it was crowded. And Charles had stated that he had not resumed his relationship with Camilla until the marriage had irretrievably broken down. But the public felt as though they knew them. They had watched this marriage break down. Charles and Diane had both spoken very frankly. So there was this public interest in seeing uh, the royal family grieving with the wider population. We look at royal history, there have been a few other moments of public grieving. Um, the future King George IV, uh, he lost his only daughter, Princess Charlotte, in childbirth. She was directly in line to the throne. This happened in 1817, and she died giving birth to a stillborn son. And there were reports at the time about people hugging each other in the streets and all of this poetry being written and songs and odes to the lost princess. And at least one historian has said Britain would not be like that again until Diana, Princess of Wales, in 19 so in the 19th century, it was Princess Charlotte, where it was this seminal moment, and for the 20th century, it was Diana. And Diana's death, in many ways, uh, considered a martyr, uh, particularly given the circumstances with the paparazzi and, and what have you, and, and what led to that fatal accident. Um, Charles has been in line for the throne for many, many years. The Queen mm -hmm. has now lived to 95 years of age. Um, is in particularly in particular the british are they willing to accept charles as a king because well, that has been a big question for a lot of people for a long time 
Well, under the terms of the Act of Settlement, which governs the succession to the throne and was updated in 2015 across the Commonwealth to be gender neutral, the next in line is automatically Prince Charles. When the Queen's reign comes to an end, he becomes king. This isn't like before the Norman Conquest in 1066, where there was the Witan and the Accession Council, and they might choose the most popular relative or the one with the most military experience. Today, the succession is automatic, and it has been uh, for centuries. And it's interesting when we look at royal history, there are cases of heirs to the throne who were less popular or were underestimated. And then they succeed to the throne and grow into the role. And an example of this is Queen Victoria's eldest son, Edward VII. He comes to the throne at 59 in 1901, and he didn't have a very good reputation. He was known for spending a lot of time at the races. There have been a lot of mistresses, you know, married women. He does testified in two different divorce cases. So Edward VII didn't have a great reputation, but he was a people person. He'd always had a lot of success on royal tours. He visited what is now Canada, British North America in 1860, and had when he was a very young man and had been acclaimed here. So he was very good at meeting people and, and, and speaking to people from a variety of walks of life. So he curved out this role for himself as a diplomat in Europe. He was closely related to other European royal houses. And now we talk about the first decade of the 20th century as the Edwardian era. And I think with Prince Charles, there's been a lot of scrutiny of his personal life, the break down of his marriage to Diana, his second marriage to Camilla, and now with Harry and Meghan, Prince Harry's comments about his father not taking his calls at various times. So Charles has been scrutinized on a personal level, but we're also seeing a lot of interest in his charitable work, that some of Prince Charles's ideas have been ahead of the curve in a variety of ways, whether it is interfaith dialogue, organic farming, youth unemployment. Some of these interests were considered a little eccentric back in the 1970s or 1980s. But in the context of the 21st century, a lot of Prince Charles's interests are in line with wider concerns about the environment and other issues that many people are facing today. So I think Prince Charles may well, uh, whenever his reign begins, uh, grow into that role and, and, and the focus shift towards some of his interests, which are indeed in, in line with wider concerns of his time. 